So the box came in the UPS yesterday. I had the son bring it into the garage, set it up here on the bench. Let's cut it open. Okay, so there's enough bubble wrap in this box to keep me busy for months, but I'm going to go ahead and set this off to the side and get the box unpacked. Izzy has pre-assembled a lot of these parts for me, so I don't have to bother with that. I'm going to go ahead and take these out, unwrap them, get everything unboxed, laid out on the table, and we'll see what we have. All right, I've got all the parts unwrapped, and we'll get started. I'll get to you later. So here's all the parts for the kit. Izzy actually put together the waste board and the frame for me and part of the Z-axis so I don't have to do that. It seems like there's a lot of parts here. You can see them popping up on the screen, but there's really not that many considering what the machine does and what it is. So it's really not that bad. Here we're putting on the two Y-axis rails. They mount to the frame with four screws on each end. So you just put one on, flip it around and rinse and repeat. They go on pretty quick. These rails are really, really stiff. I don't see how anything could deflect them. Screws go in really well. Everything's pre-threaded. The thing pretty much puts itself together if you're nice to it, as you can see. To assemble the x-axis trolley, I first got out the drive belts and attached them to the ends of the two Y rails with one of the belt clips. Next, I took the end plates and installed a servo on each one of them. The servos are mounted in slotted holes so you can adjust the slack and the belts later on. There are two belt guides that are made from four bearings with flanges on one side. Just make sure the flanges are to the outside when you made them together. The rail wheels also go on at this time. The lower rail wheels are mounted with the nuts that have an offset round shoulder on them that you will use later on to tighten them to the rail. After both plates were assembled, I attached these to the x-axis rail and set it on the y-axis rails. Then I did a test roll. It was perfectly smooth. It was just like it was riding on ice. After I determined there wasn't any binding, I went ahead and installed the four lower rail wheels to the two plates. So now it's time to install one of the y-axis belts. I thought of an easier way to do this that we'll get to when the x-axis belt is installed. After measuring the rail and I marked the center, I moved the trolley over the mark and tried to keep that as close to this spot as I could when clamping the belt down. The belt runs from one clamp through a belt guide, then up and over the servo drive wheel, through the other belt guide, and then into the other clamp. After you get the belt on and snugged up with the clamps, adjust any other tension that's in the belt out with the servo. You want it to be snug, but not really tight so you don't run the risk of wearing out any bearings on the servo or the belt guides. The Z-axis was a little bit harder. The belt comes as a loop, which you would expect, but all the belt guides and the stops are on one plate with the servo drive wheel on the other. The Z-axis plate has two springs to help it balance out the weight of the spindle. I found it was a lot easier to assemble the plates and install the drive belt before putting on the springs. Do that last and you'll save yourself a lot of headaches. As before, get the belt threaded and adjust the tension with the servo. After you get the springs on, mount it to the x-axis rail and tighten with the lower rail nuts. Okay, we are almost done. For the last real mechanical step, we're going to install the x-axis drive belt. As before, you want to mark the middle of the rail. Here's where I broke away from the instructions. I measured and I marked the center of the drive belt with a pencil, then installed the belt by draping it over the servo drive wheel, then threaded it under the two belt guides to the brackets. I rolled the servo over the center mark on the rail, kept it there, and marked where the ends of the belts would be going into the end clamps. I used those marks to thread the belt into the clamps, installed them on the end plates, and it was good to go. After taking up the slack with the servo, I tightened it down and I was ready to run wiring. Now this method worked fine for me. I was just frustrated trying to get the belt under the guides when I put them on the x-axis rails. The instructions would probably work just as well as long as the end result is the same. So now for electrical. The Shapeoko 3 has a controller board on it that takes the place of an Arduino and a servo drive board. It comes assembled on a large aluminum heat sink which is mounted on the x-axis rail. A small fan is included in the kit and that mounts onto the cover plate assembly. The controller board is clearly marked as to what servo goes where so it's really easy to wire. In addition to the servo and the fan headers, 
There's headers there to install X, Y, and Z limit switches, an e-stop, a probe, or a feed stop. There's also a pulse width modulated output that can be used to control a laser for engraving. After plugging in all the servos, I tested them using carbide motion to make sure everything was running properly, and it was. I marked directions on the rails and tried as best I could to straighten out the wiring. Now I'm a controls person by trade, so I'm really OCD about cable management. I put some tie wraps on temporarily until I can get spiral wrap to keep the wiring snag free. So here's the first thing I cut out with the CNC. It's a driveway workshop sign, which is the name of my YouTube channel. I'm cutting it onto an off cut from a deck board scrap left over from our front porch build last fall. Two mistakes I made here on my first try. One was that my workpiece wasn't flat, and as you saw there, during the first pass, it didn't cut the shop in workshop. It got to it on the next pass though, but I need to remember that everything has to be as square and as level as possible. The second was that I only generated one tool path the G-code used to cut all the sign out with. If you notice, there's a waste strip in the D and the W. My tool path was set to cut on the left of the cutter. I needed another one to cut on, on the cutter to clear all that out. If you notice, I have a Bosch Colt trim router that I'll be upgrading to a DeWalt 611 just to get that variable speed capability for it and an extra quarter horsepower. The spindle holder that comes with the Shape Oco is sized for the DeWalt. That's the one that they recommend for it. So I had to fabricate a temporary holder for my Bosch. I generated the G-code for this using Carbide Create, which is the graphic software that comes with the Shape Oco. You can do a lot of things with it, like lettering for signs like I'm doing here, import vector graphic pictures and resize them, and then you can do some basic snap drawings like lines, circles, polygons, that kind of thing. When you're all done with your picture, you generate G-code that's going to be sent to the machine. The machine actually is controlled using another free program called Carbide Motion. You use that to send the G-code to the machine controller. You can exercise the servos, zero the machine out. It has some other features in it that you'll need to run the machine with. Except for that leftover strip in the D&W, it cut out pretty well and I'm pretty happy with it. So with the cutter out of the way, I pulled the sign off the double stick tape I had holding it to the wasteboard. It turned out pretty well. I'm gonna paint the letters and run it through the joiner to take off all the surface paint and see how it goes. Every CNC project I've seen on YouTube has some kind of a christening video that shows the owner running a stock G-code file to draw something on paper, officially starting up their machine. In this case, I'm using the Shape Oco logo. It printed out great, and I can't wait to learn the technology and start building with it. This is a really solid machine that's easy to build. Carbide 3D has a real winner on their hands. So I just want to say a couple of things in closing. First, a huge thanks to Izzy Swan for the opportunity to build this machine with him and for everything that he does in the maker community that we're all involved with. I've gotten to know him online over the last few months, and I'll tell you, I can't think of another one of us that's a bigger cheerleader and a mentor for the group than Izzy is. So my, so my impressions now that I'm done building a three, the biggest one is that it's a very solid machine. The rails are real meaty. They don't flex for anything. The tracks are really smooth on the rails. It's been extruded very well. Uh, the electrical components on it, uh, they cut down by using a PC board instead of like an Arduino and another servo driver. They've cut down the uh, paths to failure for that. So it's a more dependable machine in the long run. And the cabling is not bad on it. It's just a really good machine overall. Carbide has just released uh, some larger versions of the three. So if you want to make signs or you expect to do something a little bit bigger than what I have here, which is a 16 by 16 working area, I would look into those versions of it. I like the software they came out with for making basic parts. You know, if you're going to cut out knobs, small things like that, that you don't really necessarily have to go into something like Inkscape, uh, create a vector graphics file and then import it into uh, play with it. You could use what they gave you and that's carbide motion and carbide create. If there was one thing that I would like them to change on it if they could is that you would set up a user defined area that you could put your G code files and your carbide create file at so that the user didn't have to click on four or five different things to make small changes and then jump back and forth in between 
software and what they're actually doing on the machine. I'm going to mod this machine though. I'm going to put inductive proximity sensors on it for in-stop detectors instead of mechanical limit switches. I'm possibly going to use that for the probe input also. And I'm going to build a, a speed display that reads out an RPM for the router. So with that DeWalt 611, you can adjust the speed on it. And uh, this thing will read out an RPM, like I said, so I can tell how fast it's set up. One other thing I was really impressed was with the support group Carbide has, you can find out, gosh, you can just find out just about anything you want to about the machine. There's a lot of people there that know a lot about the product and the CNC industry, and they want to help you succeed. If you want to build one of these machines, I'd love to help too. I'll pay it back by doing a Google Hangout with you. I'll move my webcam around on the machine. I'll show you what uh, you know the thing looks like or what it's supposed to look like when it's been put together. I'll help you put it together online, whatever you want to do. I'm willing to make that offer by paying it back for this machine that uh, I got here from Izzy and from Shapeoko. So like Izzy said, this is my channel, Driveway Workshop. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as Jim Bashirs, and I'm pretty active in the I Like to Make Stuff group. My reason for starting the channel is that I think we all need to give back what we learned over the years, and I've got a lot of them on me, believe me, no matter how it relates to making things. So the tagline for my channel is going to be learn, make, share, and repeat. I'd obviously appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button, and let's all keep learning and making.